Good morning. Happy Sabbath. What a beautiful Sabbath day. Rain or shine, sun or cloud, it's a beautiful Sabbath day because it is the Sabbath. Lesson 12 already. I think I say that every week, lesson whatever it is already, except for lesson one and two. But anyway, yeah. Joseph, Prince of Egypt. Yes, we're nearing the end of, of Genesis and... Uh, end of the quarter. How yeah. appropriate. Let's start with prayer, as always. Dear Jews, we come to you this morning thanking you for the authors who prepared this lesson for us, thanking you for preserving this material for us all these years. The lesson of forgiveness, of reconciliation. We thank you, Lord, that we have these examples pre-type of what you were to do to set an example for the children of Israel way back when, for us now as well. As we study this lesson, Lord, I pray the Holy Spirit will enlighten our minds and hearts and truly, truly give us the blessing you want us to receive that you have prepared, that we will be enabled to be as Joseph, forgive and reconcile. These things I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Short memory verse this week. Yes, it 41, is. 41, 41. Cool text, too. Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I 41, have set 41. you over all the land of Egypt. That would terrify me, but... But you're not Joseph. But I'm not Joseph. <laughs> he I, was ready for it. I mean, he had done Potiphar's house. He had done the whole prison. Yes. And with God's inspiration and wisdom imparted to him. You know, it's interesting, we'll get to it a little bit later in the lesson, but the same phrase that that Pharaoh used is the same phrase that Solomon used at the beginning of his reign, asking God for wisdom and discernment. Yeah. Anyway, so, we'll get to it later in the lesson. In the end, when we look at this part of the story, this is the part where Joseph is um, leading his brothers on a journey through self-examination, through... Disposition of guilt? Yes, and then eventually... Forgiveness and reconciliation. Yeah. And it's an interesting story, this you know, part and of I it. Never, I never thought of this story, the whole story of Joseph, of being a story of forgiveness and reconciliation. It's always been kind of like... See, if you commit yourself to God, everything works out great. Well, that's because we didn't read the end of the chapter. Yeah, I did. Well, maybe we but just... But not with these authors and their, their insights and their, their, yeah. their uh, scholarly work. But when I look at this, I think about how um, Joseph is kind of like doing well, the work of the Holy Spirit. Well, he and he's also... The archetype of Jesus to come, as many of the patriarch forefathers were, in one way or another. I guess it hadn't occurred to me that way, but it's kind of an interesting picture of of his his desire to um, know his brothers. I mean, he left them when he was just a kid, and now we're looking what and we're looking at years later. Well, yeah. Quite a number, almost two decades later. That be twenty years. And he's recognizing how, you know, how they have maybe changed, hoping but not sure, and going to test them to see what happens. So as we look at Sunday's lesson, this one is about um, Joseph's rise to power. So um, Joseph has now gone to Pharaoh. And he's revealed what God is going to do. Now, I have to tell you that, well, I ask God about the weather often. You know, God, we're having this program. Can you please make sure that the weather is such and such um, for picnics in the you park? You don't get not cows too and hot. corn in your dreams that nope. night then? Oh. No, nope, not a single one. And when you look at it, I, I often pray, oh, Lord, don't let it rain on this. You know, especially <laughs> when I'm younger. Um, but when we look at that concept, you know, often it's about what we want right now. But when Joseph is looking at the weather, rarely do we say, well, they do call him act of God, don't they? But rarely do we say... Just for insurance purposes. God is going to, you know, God is going to do this. 
But in fact, as we look at it, um, you know, they had a period of famine because, you know, of no rain, because of the issues of the day, um, whether it was only heat or dry winds or, you know, whatever it happened to be, it was going to cause issues uh, for them later. So Joseph now, like Tom said, he's run a household. He's run the jail. Well, it was Pharaoh's prison. It wasn't just a jail. So there were probably thousands of prisoners. But looking at that, he, he was able to, to hone skills that would give him beyond just a, a soothsayer or a, a, some kind of person who um, could tell dreams. Well, and dreams and multiple gods, the pantheons of gods that the Egyptians had, this was a very much a part of their culture. So it was God, just as in with, with Elijah and Baal too, or Baal, who was the god of rain, the god of weather, the god of crops and fertility and so forth. This played right into the ancient culture of the, of the Egyptian people during this time. And to have a dream which they believed very much were dreams were very much a part of their reality that would come to be or was something from the past, revealed something and so forth. It worked well. And after Joseph comes and, and tells the interpretation of the dream and what it means, and, you know, I'm not so sure if I had that dream, I'd know what it meant. But uh, I just think it was something crazy, you know. But if we the very fact that 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 uh, God used the dream of Pharaoh, or maybe gave Pharaoh the dream even, to have Joseph brought out of prison to say, here's one who can interpret dreams, and he's right on. Let him, let him tell you too. But, but Pharaoh's, right in the middle of the lesson, Pharaoh uh, recognizes the presence of the Spirit of God, as in Joseph, who is qualified, discerning, and wise. And there is the, char the phrase discerning and wise, which we see again in 1 Kings 3, 12, in talking about Solomon. Yeah. So I want to go back to the Bible. If you open to Genesis 41, um, you know, in Joseph's interpreting the dream, he didn't just <laughs> interpret the dream that, you know, there'll be this famine and you'll already have plenty set aside. Um, but then... Um, Verse 32, and the doubling of Pharaoh's dream means that the thing is fixed by God and God will shortly bring it to pass. Now, therefore, let Pharaoh seek, select a man, discreet and wise, and set him over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh proceed to appoint overseers over the land and take a fifth part of the produce of the land of Egypt during the seven plenteous years. And let them gather all the food of these good years that are coming and lay up grain under the authority of Pharaoh for food in cities and let them keep it. And that food shall be a reserve for the land against the seven years of famine, which are to befall the land of Egypt, so that the land may not perish through the famine. This proposal seemed good to Pharaoh and to all the servants. And Pharaoh said to the servants, Can you find such a man as this in whom... Is the Spirit of God? So Pharaoh said to Joseph, Since God has shown you all this, there is none so discreet and wise as you are, and you shall be over my house, and my people shall order themselves as you command. Only as regards to the throne will I be greater than you. And then Pharaoh goes on to say, Behold, I have set you over the land of Egypt. Pharaoh took his signet ring, ring from his hand and put it on Joseph's hand a rang him garments of fine linen and put a gold chain around his neck and made him ride in the second chariot. And they cried before him, bow the knee. I was thinking about the story of Mordecai who had, you know. Who wanted that. Yeah. And Haman ended up, I mean, Haman wanted it, but Mordecai ended up with yes. it. Yes. And I am Fowler and without your consent, no man shall lift a hand or, or to all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh called Joseph's names Oh my heavens. No, that wasn't Zav the name. Amph Panna. I have no idea. And he gave his daughter um, to Joseph. 
and um, the greatest honor. He was 30 years old. He and then for the first that, seven, yeah, like... for the first seven years oh, yeah, yeah, of yeah, plenty, yeah. he would rule and taking that, that fifth portion and putting it away and setting people to make sure that it was safe and cared for and that it could be used um, in later times. Joseph's name, that was the phonetic spelling, is uh, Zephanath Parnath. Yeah, or something. But in any case, the one the one fifth is critical here because usually um, uh, reigning kings and and emperors and so forth in agrarian society took forty percent, double that. So this this seven years of plenty must have been enormous because the storehouses they already had they had to build new ones, and it was only going to take half as much from the people as normal. So this, yeah. these seven years of plenty must have been just an enormous amount and then be able to store needed quantities. Well, and then Joseph, if you, if you yeah. finish off the story, which the lesson doesn't really finish it off, um, I think we read it last week, when the famine did come, Joseph held off and held off and held off and held off until people in the cities were starving and said, please give us some food, we're starving, literally. And then he opened up the straws to the Egyptian people first, and then to the those who came to buy. Well, and looking at the idea of how much came um, during that time, uh, the Bible says plenteous years brought forth abundantly. And if you think about that, how much food would come from that to feed millions? to feed millions for seven years. That amount, um, I, I was pondering this as I read this the first time. Um, I wonder if God did the loaves and fishes thing. That Fish. he would, okay. <laughs> and she teaches the English. Fish. The loaves and fishes. Because that's Fish. what some versions of the Bible say. Uh, just like all my sheeps in the herd. Mm. Anyway, but sometimes there's an E-S. Okay, so yes, anyway. Yes, as us. Yes, something. But when we look at that, looking at God's blessing and uh, what he wanted to do, I, Joseph, um, during this time, he was blessed with a wife, and they had two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, and their names were kind of like Ecclesiastes 1, you know, the opposite, you know, pain brings um, joy and um, what's the other one? Affliction into, into fruitfulness. Yes. And um, so Joseph, his life was blessed abundantly, not just the, the journey of the, um, you know, of the people of the day. And of but course, also, then to his two sons would uh, pick up or become two additional tribes of Israel when Reuben and and uh, well, one of the other brothers was like kicked out of the of the inheritance of the twelve tribes of Israel. But that's that's many years later. Okay, forty two, chapter forty two, Joseph. So here we see the brothers coming. They've run out of food in their hometown, so to speak. So this famine must have been quite large, this drought over a large area. A Mediterranean drought. Because they drought. were, you know, in Canaan. They were a good distance away, uh, several days or months journey. But, you know, I, I guess I never realized that people in that part of the world, I mean, think about Mary and Joseph. They went to Egypt to get away from, you know, that, that, Corner so of the it was Mediterranean. Only a several days journey, not months. Or well, maybe, maybe a week or so. I wouldn't want to walk it. I, I. It's well, not no, that close. Yeah, right. But when you look at it, you know, we think in our day, you know, and time, we go, oh, that's going all the way from Israel across, you know, um, that whole peninsula and area down to Egypt, and we think, wow, that's so far, but. Probably, in essence, it's not that far. 
But when we look at Joseph... Um, okay, it's not around the block. Joseph doesn't know that his brothers are coming. Jacob is the one who initiates this, this whole thing. So when Jacob learned there was grain in Egypt, he said to his sons, um, why do you look at one another? And they said, <laughs> um, he said, behold, I've heard there's grain in Egypt. Go down and buy grain for us that we may live and not die. And 10 of the brothers went down to buy grain in Egypt. Before you go there, I can't just see them sitting around the, the dining, dining room carpet saying, so, Levi, do you have any grain? I don't have any grain. Do you have any grain? No, I don't have any grain. Do you have a card? Do you have any flake? No, I don't have any grain. Do you have any do you have any grain? Do you have any grain? Ruby, do you have any grain? So Jacob interrupts and says, oh, well, hang on, boys, stop. Why are you looking at each other? We don't have any grain, okay? We need to go buy. And, and I understand so, it's in Egypt, so... Pack it up and head on down. And so they start down, and um, we see them going to Egypt. And their expectation and what they see was a vizier of Pharaoh. And I wonder, I wonder if Jacob, Jacob, if Joseph didn't tell his Egyptian minions now there may be a good number of people coming from all over the world and look out for specifically specifically for a group of 10 men with all these animals to pack lots of food because why else would joseph all of a sudden see these people hundreds of thousands of people are getting food because god led them to the place where joseph was the going to be overseeing to headquarters you so don't, to speak. you don't think that he said look out for these guys that are probably gonna be coming no i don't think so um, when we look at that, um, they come in and they bow down to the vizier. The idea that they come to the headquarters, um, they're expecting to be, you know, Joseph could have sent them here or there. Or maybe, to maybe other foreigners cities. had to come to see the vizier first. Exactly. And mm. so, and that's why I think it's that way. Well, that makes anyway, sense. Anyway, because he was the governor, he was the vizier. And when you look at that, um, it's very interesting. If you look at this part of history, um, and we, we know when this occurred because of how things were written between the two periods yes, and the fact in the that second the fact that there were other non-Egyptian vissers as well. Yes, and that was the one thing. Sometimes we get the idea that only Egyptians. But we, we know Moses. And Babylonians, for that matter, yeah. too, because they Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego This was above. a very multicultural society. They, they wanted society. the best, obviously, to rule. Yes. So whether, you know, it wasn't a political thing. It was who's best qualified. Hmm. Yeah. So when we look at that, the brothers bow down. So now we have literally the fulfillment of that dream. The first dream. With the yes. sheaves bowing down to the ones. The ten brothers up. are there, and um, they don't even know yet that their bowing down is a fulfillment of that. But then, when you look at the idea of the events, um, as time goes on, they're going to. Um, Figure out that, oh dear, oh dear. So let's look at um, at the Joseph when he encounters his brothers. So we're looking at 42. Six. Verse six. Now Joseph was a governor of the land. It was he who sold all to all the people of the land. And Joseph's brothers came and bowed themselves before their faces to ground. Joseph saw his brothers and knew them but treated them like strangers and spoke roughly to them. Where did he come from? And they said from the land of Cana to buy food. Joseph knew his brothers. They didn't know him. And Joseph remembered the dreams which he had dreamed of them. And he began to think, you know, I don't know how that would be to see brothers and think, oh, they've come to buy food for me. And then kind of in the back of his mind, oh, yeah, this is God again. This is God again sending me my brothers. So um, he says, you're spies. You've come to see the weakness of the land. And they said, no, no, we've come to buy food. Um, that you're, that's why we are here. 
We are all sons of one man. We are honest men. Your servants are not spies. And he said to them, no, it is the weakness of the land that you've come. So he's testing them. He's like poking the bear there to see what they have to say. Because they say that we're all honest good. No, we are your servants, 12 brothers, the sons of one man in the land of Cana. And beheld the youngest this day is with our father, and one is no more. But Joseph said to them, It is as I said to you, you're spies. But this you shall be tested by the life of Pharaoh. You shall not go from this place unless your youngest brother comes here. Send one of you and let him bring your brother while the rest of you, while you remain in prison, that your words may be tested, whether there is truth in it or else by the life of Pharaoh. Surely you are spies. And he put them all in prison for three days. So it was a short journey. If they only were there for three days. No, he said. He put them all there. Right. They haven't sent anybody back. Oh. Uh, On the so third day. So he just day, throws them in for three days to say, let's them Let's them meditate for three days. <laughs> so Sometimes three, days, three days is always a good kind of thing. Isn't that well, what Jonah was in? You know, I yeah. the more I read about the numbers in the Bible, the more I think it's, and with the Hebrew culture importance of numbers, I think many of the time they're symbolic. They're not real, but that's beside the point. The fact are they're in jail. They're waiting now for Joseph to determine what he's going to do with them. And on the third day, verse 18 of chapter 42. Um, Joseph says to them, do this and you will live for I fear God. If you are honest men, let one of your brothers remain confined in your prison and let the rest go and carry the grain for the family or households and bring your youngest brother to me so your words will be verified and you shall not die. And they did so. They said to one another, in truth, we are all guilty concerning our brother in that we saw the distress of his soul and he brought, uh, um, besought us and we would not listen. Therefore, um, is this distress come upon us? So looking at retribution... Old Testament, God has always looked at as, you know, God's punishment. God's eye for punishment. Eye, tooth for a tooth. God's punishment. And we would not listen. Therefore, um, this is distress. Reuben answered them, did I not tell you um, not to sin against the lad, but you wouldn't listen? Now, um, so now there comes a reckoning of blood. They did not know that Joseph understood them, for it's their interpreter between them. And he turned them away and wept, and he returned to them and spoke, and he took Simon from them and bound him before their eyes. And Joseph gave orders to fill the bags with grain and to receive every man's money in his sack and to give them provisions for the journey. And this was done for them when they loaded their asses with the grain and departed. And one of them opened the sack to give his ass provider in lodging place. And he saw his money in the mouth of the sack, and he said to the brothers, Money has been put back in the mouth of my sack. At their hearts they failed and they turned trembling to one another. What is this God has done to us? When they came to Jacob, their father, they told him all that had befallen. This man, Lord of the land, spoke roughly to us and took us to be spies. What we said to him, we're honest, we're not spies. By this you shall know they are honest men. Leave your brothers, bring your youngest brother. And they emptied their sacks and all the money was back. And their fa father saw the money and they were dismayed. And Jacob said, you have bereaved me of my children, Joseph no more, and Simeon no more, and now you would take Benjamin, and this has come upon me. And Reuben said to him, Slay my two sons if I do not bring him back to you. Put him in my hands, and I will bring him back to you. And he said, My son shall not go down with you, for his brother is dead, and only he is left. If harm should befall him on the journey um, you are to make, you would bring down my gray hairs with sorrow. Um, Anyway, as they go on, they they had eaten all that they brought back. Well, and I'm sure they had it for their animals, too. So they must have had a huge quantity of grain. But it's interesting to, that the lesson points out that when the brothers are talking and they say to themselves, they said to one another, that it's the exact same phrase used when they applied to get rid of Joseph. And Joseph's understanding all this. Now, he might not have heard them back in the land of Shechem when they first grabbed him and plotted his demise or thought it yeah, was his demise. exactly. But he's hearing them and understanding them now. And, you know, the fact that uh, uh, Simeon is uh, the one now talking uh, to Jacob that Tracy just read, 
Yeah, I think it was Reuben and Simeon that Manasseh and Ephraim took the place of. But in any case, so Reuben's words of we're going to get it have come full circle. It's really that karma thing. And Jacob was not eager to have Benjamin go anywhere. And so they stayed. They stayed. They ate what they had, you know, but the famine's going on. Now, I wonder, you know, I, I thought about this as I read this. Why are they not worried about um, or recognizing how long the famine's going to go? Because the likelihood they didn't have one that long prior to this time. That no, could be. Just guessing here, because we don't have meteorological records from that time. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, anyway, as we look at this, now they, they um, have to go back. Um, Jacob says, you have to go back and get more. Of course, they're thinking, oh, man, we had all the money in our sacks of grain. And he's sending us back to our death. If we can't take Benjamin, what are we going to do? And of course, you know, the um, Judah then says, I'll, I'll make sure Benjamin comes back. Don't worry. Um, and Jacob finally says, okay, all right, we've got to have well, food. There you go. They're probably like having eaten in a few days. And they're, 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 no, they're, they're done for if they don't get more or food. Or they're down to just a little bit anyway. And so in uh, Genesis 43, then this is where Benjamin begins to play a key role. Joseph wants to know, has Benjamin been mistreated like he was among the older brothers? He wants to know. He wants to see if... Um, if there's been a change in if the, there's been in a the change. other ten brothers. Yes, brothers. yes. And so um, it's kind of an interesting um, section of this story to me because Benjamin, Joseph is so excited to see his brother. You know, this is his little brother, the little... Well, we haven't got there yet. They're still in Canaan. You're jumping way ahead here. Okay, so you better say what you want to say then. You're, you're jumping from they haven't gone back yet to Joseph and Benjamin are meeting. Joseph and Benjamin, Judah says, I'll take care of them, and off they go to Egypt. Okay, there we go. Okay. So we're heading back down to Egypt land, way down in Egypt land. Okay. Let's buy some grain in Egypt land. Okay. So they get there, and they all come before Joseph, of course, because at this time, I think he did actually send people to watch for them. And they corralled them together and took them to Joseph. And here they all are. And I think Jacob even gave them... The original sum plus more money to buy grain this time. So they're taking double the amount of money to buy. And here they are, and they get back in Egypt. We're looking at 43 toward the end. Um, when we look at this section, um, Joseph calls them together for a meal. And they have actually... They have actually, um, how do I say, acknowledged, you know, we opened our sacks to feed our animals, and there was the money that we had already put for you. And then, um, this is like verse 20 and 43, and, oh Lord, we came down to buy food, and we came, it, it, we brought it back, you know, they're like confessing, trying to... <laughs> You know, we're not thieves. We're yeah, not spies. We're not, we're not the spies. We're not the thieves that you can, said we were. And um, we don't know how that money got in our sack. And this is what Joseph then is going to begin to show them some grace. Rest assured, do not be afraid. Your God and the God of your father must have put treasure in sack for you. I received your money. And then he brought uh, Simeon out to them. And of course... You know, they were given, you know, wash their hands and feet and all that kind of thing. Um, and they were going to have a meal. And Joseph um, brought them into the house um, and bowed him down to the ground and inquired of their welfare. Is your father well? The old man you spoke of, is he still alive? Let's see, would you get suspicious if this guy says, so how's your, how's your dad doing? Okay, 
But if you think about Making small talk all most, of a sudden. Most of the Egyptians, well, many of them shaved their head. They sure, wore of... coal around their eyes and other colors. They, they, they're... To, to guard against the heat and insects, yes. Well, they there did were makeup things... and they shaved their head and so forth and, and all of that. Yes. You know, with a different... You know, we often identify people by, you know, well, features. And again, Joseph is 10 years plus old, 20 years older. Yes. He was, seven, granted, 17 is a mature enough male to look pretty much the same, but he's not going to look the same. Yes. And then, of course, he looks up at Benjamin and he says, is this the youngest brother? Knowing it is. And um, God be gracious to you, my son. So he's he's like... Um, really extending hospitality where he'd been kind of like grouchy. And then um, Joseph left. He had to go away and cry a little bit um, because he was so glad to He's see. He's going to make his mascara run. Uh, probably. And then he washed his face. <laughs> see? <laughs> and he came out. Um, and put more makeup on. And controlling himself said, um, let the food be served. And so they were all there together. Um, they gave he gave made sure that Benjamin got more food than the other brothers. See if they would still act jealous, jealously and enviously toward Benjamin as they had to Joseph. Yes. Now and what's interesting is didn't. they had to be served separately. So he was served food. He ate, and then the then Joseph the, was served separately yeah, from the brothers. Yes. yes. And then they he were had his given own table, food. In fact, yes, he couldn't sit with them. They were foreigners, and they were set according to their age and whatever. Um, and of course, um, now see, wouldn't that give you a clue to how does he know their ages? See, these brothers either are really dense or they're so worried about what's going to happen they don't really think what's going on. But that's not part of the story. That's not consequential to the story. What's consequential here is we see that the brothers have changed. They have matured in their understanding of family relations and have perhaps not given Benjamin the hard time they gave Joseph, even though Benjamin was greatly loved more than the other ten because he was the son of Rachel. Yes. So he loads their sacks up and he decides... And puts their money back in and... Test number two, or three, The drinking cup. Now, this cup, I always thought it was just his, Joseph's cup. You know, had, like, this cup's mine in, uh, engraved in it. But yeah. the lesson points out Great that this dad. was... Yeah. <laughs> world's best dad. That, that this cup was a divining cup that, that, that Joseph took on as part of the culture... To, to determine dreams and tell the future. This was his divining cup. Now, Mrs. White points out that he didn't use it for that, but he didn't say it wasn't for that. So he didn't say it wasn't, but he didn't say it was. So he kind of used the culture of the day to further God's cause. Yeah. So, um... So it wasn't anyway. a magic cup for... Just kind of like in the middle of the lesson. The magic cup was for Joseph's a pretext to invoke the supernatural domain and thus awaken in his brother's hearts the sense of guilt uh, toward God. I skipped a line there. I yeah. Just framed there. And then Jus uh, Judah interprets Joseph's implied message because he refers to the iniquity that God has found in them. Anyway, when you look at this, um, they, they get up and as soon as, you know, he sends the men out, and they barely had gotten going, and he sends his men out, go back and search. And you know, thinking here too, the Bible says that that how many men came out? All the brothers. No, 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 to oh. go after them. Um, the steward, Joseph's steward. Uh, da, 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 da. It doesn't say. Yeah, it does. Okay, you read it because I can't okay, I'm find gonna it. I'm going to look for it. She's going to go on. All right. But as we look at that, he's going out after um, the brothers are like, not again. Last time we left and there was money in our sacks. When they had gone a short distance from the city, Joseph said to his steward, up, follow after these men. 
and when you overtake them, say, Why have you returned evil for good? Why have you stolen my silver cup? Is it not from the is it not from this that the, my Lord drinks, and that he divines, and you have done wrong? So when they overtook them, he spoke these words. Now it says, when he overtook them. So it sounds like it's just this one man. You know, if they had been the same brothers, they would have said, let's get him! And they would have beaten him up and hightailed it on out of there. Well, my guess is he had other people with him. Well, but in essence, the maybe issue... Maybe not. The issue comes where, um, you know, he said... Um, so they go um, through the sacks, and of course, guess whose sack it's in? Reuben's. No. Gad's. No. Levi. Ishakar. Issachar. No. Just because you're trying to prove you know all the sons of Jacob. Japheth. Okay. So when we look Ham. at this, Shem. we of course find... Oh, too early. Benjamin. It was in Benjamin's sack, of course. We know that story from kindergarten days. Yes. And, um, you know, well, I have to take him back. And Judah's like, no, no. Naphtali? Judah says, no, no, no. Take me. Take me. Um, I I am, I'm the one who, you know, I'm the one with the problem. Let it be me, because he knows. Well, Judah was the one that said, let's sell Joseph. Yeah. So you see, here, here is Jesus' lineage, the tribe of Judah, the lion-hearted. And here he is taking responsibility. For Not something just responsibility, but willing to substitute. Ago, years ago. Yeah. Because he says, you know, it all came about because of me. Well, they go back. Yeah. Back to the, to, the, to the house, to the granary, to wherever Joseph is. Yeah. And... Um, When they look, when we get to this point, um, <sighs> Joseph realizes. I mean, they realize that that uh, they're in in serious trouble. So when they get back, they're dragged back. They all end up so going back. Judah presents himself, and the and servants says, no, no, say, no. Um, "You know, Joseph." Joseph is going to uh, show them who he is. He has been able to understand them. He hasn't needed that interpreter. He's used the interpreter like he couldn't understand. But can you imagine the shock? And what that would do to you, knowing your past, knowing what you had had. I often have wondered if the brothers remembered the dream or not. Until Joseph, even after Joseph revealed himself, did they really understand the significance of God giving that dream? Was that dream just for Joseph to have the assurance? Or was it going to be a, a moment of... A gestalt? Yes. Uh, oh. Ooh, that's it. Yes. Well, I think it probably was on both parties um, because obviously Joseph being hauled off to Egypt might have remembered these dreams, but thinking how on earth is this going to happen? I'm so far away from my family. But the fact that Joseph tells them, I'm your brother Joseph, and they are like, what? Huh? No, you don't. You can't be after. He says again, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. He's telling them history to prove to him that he is Joseph, that they that he knows that they are his half brothers, and that he is Joseph, the one they tried to get rid of, but they sold instead to make a little coin. And so, when he, verse chapter forty five is where Joseph begins to to tell them, and he he cries. He made sure nobody else was around. And Joseph says to his brother, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? The guys are like, who is he talking about? <laughs> and uh, Joseph said, come near to me. And they came nearer and he said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold to Egypt. Now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves. 
because you sold me here. Here's the, here's, g- here's, the, here's the clutch. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For the ha- famine has been in the land these two years, and there are yet five years in which there will neither be plowing nor harvest. God sent me before you to preserve you as a remnant of the earth, to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. And he has made me a father to Pharaoh, the Lord of all his house and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Make haste and go to my father and say to him, Thus says your son Joseph, God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down, do not tarry. You shall dwell in the land of Goshen. You shall be near me, you and your children and your children's children and your flocks and herds and all that you have. And there I will provide for you. For there are yet five years of famine to come, lest you and your household and all that you have come to poverty. And now as my mouth speaks to you, you must tell my father all and bring him down. And he fell on Benjamin's neck and wept. And Benjamin wept on his neck and he kissed all his brothers and wept on them. After that, the brothers talked with him. Can you imagine when they get home and say, hey, Dad, guess what? Joseph's alive. He's with us doing all this grain and money stuff. Let's go. I'm surprised Jacob didn't die of a heart attack. Well, there could be that. No, he lived a good number of years still before, yeah. before he buried him and made him promise to take him to Canaan again. But anyway. Yeah. And wow. so they're coming back. That, that revelation... As I as I read through this lesson, one of the things that I wondered about Joseph as vizier is is bringing his father to be honored just like he is. That's some confidence. Well, not only that, but it's the whole household, hundreds, maybe maybe a thousand or so people, because you know. Jacob was a wealthy man, just as his father and his grandfather were, maybe even more so. Of course, the famine might have done in a few of their flocks, but, you know, those sheepies and camelies and cattleies and so forth. But I think but this still, is... But still, it was a very huge, because Joseph sent wagons to collect the meat. Yes. So this was a big trip. But the generosity, sometimes we look at forgiveness and we say, I forgive you. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah and then we yeah, kind of yeah. let it be that. But for Joseph, he had already seen the end and was looking back at how God had led him. And so he realized that if these events had not come to fruition, he could not have been in a place to save his father and well, family. And, and that the known world that the generosity that generosity to me is speaks of the character of Joseph but also his understanding of the generosity of God and the fact that he had earned enough political, political clout. yeah to give them the best land. That the this people, was Pharaoh's land. Not, not, common Egyptians did not live in Goshen. Yeah, and so <clears throat> it was beyond, uh, beyond. And, and so think about, think about this too. It was a good number of years that the children of Israel, Jacob's uh, predecessors, Jacob's lineage. Occupied the land of Goshen to the point where Pharaoh finally says, uh, there's too many of those people. They might take over. Yeah, but that's another story. Well, that is, but my point is, Joseph had enough political clout that for many years after his death, his prodigy, 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 prodigy. progeny could still occupy the best land in Egypt. The, the future pharaohs respected Joseph and what he had done and let them continue there to the point where they multiplied, where they were like, oh my goodness, these are going to take us over. We got to do something. Yeah. And that that idea, that graciousness, um, that generosity, 
Sometimes we think of grace as, I got saved. But when we look at graciousness, it's the, it's the beneficence of what someone is willing to do um, that goes beyond the normal, that is, is beyond the generous. And the fact that people recognized that, that Joseph had saved them, therefore his family was to be honored just like, like he was. When we get to the end here, as we look at the um, chapter 46, um, jo um, Jacob, now Israel, says, I will go. I will go to my son. Well, he doesn't and have a whole lot to keep him in Canaan. There's no food, no. there's no crops. There's So yeah. economically, it's a smart move. And he goes... Um, They pack up and head out. And... Yeah, and when you when you look at that, Jacob is going to be as faithful to God as he has been. You know, I sometimes wonder if he's like the prodigal father who has <laughs> prayed. You know, God, I if if he did happen to live, but they say he's dead, but. You know, in his heart, maybe he continued to hope. We don't know. But when we get to the end, um, the end talks a little bit on Friday about um, the, the boys in confinement, right? They're in prison. And they reflected on their past wrongs and their cruelty Joseph. And they knew if they were convicted of being spies... They had no evidence um, one way or the other. They knew that um, there was no way that they were getting out of there. They knew that, that in their hearts that they had sinned against their father, against Joseph, and... Um, they were going to do everything they could to make sure Benjamin didn't suffer that. But when we look at that, that kind of repentance, that knowing in their hearts that they had done wrong, um, that repentance, I think it's really important for us to look at because it's, it's without repentance that we ignore grace. But our appreciation of the grace is so much greater. Well, because repentance, of course, it means that you're totally going back on what you had said or done before. You're making, mm -hmm. uh, in the Greek word translated into English, repentance, it means to make a 180 degree turn, to go back, to, to return to where you came from, uh, which would be a center of grace, of course, ideally moving away from grace and, and sinning and iniquity. But the very fact that, that Joseph is here with his family now, they're reunited. If you read on, and I'll admit I haven't read Lesson 12. I don't know where the chapter where we're ending 13. up. Or 13, rather, yeah. where it ends up. But Jacob lives another 17 years here in the land of Goshen. And the Bible says that they multiplied exceedingly in those 17 years. Well, so they were good years. And that's the plentiful that... Um, that was promised, you know. Sometimes we look at, we'll have enough food. But God <clears throat> never is about just, am I getting you by? God is, is always about generosity. And it's generosity, it's not just about food. But that Joseph would prosper, that his family would prosper. It was beyond what Joseph first imagined with those dreams. It was far beyond that. And yet that repentance that comes from the brothers, that forgiveness that Joseph experiences, recognizing that all of this is brought about by God. As I was thinking, what's our takeaway from this lesson? Generosity. Sometimes we worry about our generosity. If I, 
I, I, I shouldn't have done that. That was a bit much. Or, oh, those people, they won't appreciate what I have done. Is that... That's not being very generous. Generosity that comes from the heart, you don't care whether they they think it's enough or too much or they don't accept it. It's because you want to give it, not because they deserve it or they think they should get it. It's because you want to give. And beyond that, it's it's literally, if we are giving from our response to God's graciousness, I I often say, you know, have I outgiven God today? And the answer is always no. no. And so our generosity that we offer to other people, our graciousness is our response to the forgiveness that God has given to us, his His prosperity that he's given us, the, the leading in our lives, all of that prompts that that gratitude that can't be outgiven. Um, God, God is a generous God. And that's the story of Joseph. God's generosity. Whether we see it or not, whether we recognize that we look back, Joseph certainly did and was grateful. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful that you have been so generous we can't begin to come close to offering it, the generosity and the graciousness that you give us but lord make our hearts responsive to your grace and to your generosity may we show it to others so that they say who is this god who is this god who is so generous that's who we want to be this week. May we have opportunity. May we have um, times given to us. And may we re recognize that these are the days that you've given us to show others who you are. May you come soon so that we can go to heaven with you. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Do have a blessed Sabbath and a great week.